Father, we have so much for which to be thankful. We were able to get out of bed today and dress ourselves, and we had food to eat if we wanted breakfast, and we had a vehicle to come to church, and we have this safe, warm, nice building to meet in. We have so much to be thankful for. We're able to hear the worship. We're able to sing our songs, maybe not always on perfect pitch, but we're able to make a joyful noise to you. Our minds are uh, working well enough that we're able to get here and participate. We just have so many things, Lord, that we take for granted that we realize there are a lot of people, or even in our lives, who do not have those blessings. And so we first just want to pause to say thank you for all of the blessings that you give to us. And we thank you most of all for your amazing grace, that grace that led Jesus to come down to this earth to die for our sins, that powerful grace that raised him from the dead, that grace that made it possible for us to understand that God loved us, that grace that caused us to say yes to you, and that grace that is keeping us day by day and moment by moment, living for you, how thankful we are. And one of these days, we're going to experience that grace in a face-to-face -face way when we go to where you are and we are able to see you face-to-face -face and worship you for all eternity. And, and it just staggers our minds that after we've been there for 10,000 years, it will just be like day one. Uh, we're looking forward to spending eternity with whatever it has for us. Uh, we, we thank you for that promise. But we also thank you for your promise in the here and now that until we get there to heaven, you are with us here. That amazing grace that we celebrate at Christmas time, that God loved us so much that he gave us his son. And we're so thankful for your presence with us day by day, moment by moment. Maybe we had a rough patch this week and you were right there with us. Maybe we're heading into a rough patch this coming week. You're gonna be right there with us. And we're so thankful for that promise of your amazing grace. Lord, we realize that that grace extends beyond our salvation. It covers every area of our lives because you're interested in every area of our lives. So for those of us with physical needs, we cry out to you to be our great physician, to make us whole. For those of us, Lord, who maybe are, are struggling mentally or emotionally, we ask for your healing and we ask for your peace. For those of us, Lord, who are carrying heavy burdens and there seems to be no way out, we pray that you would strengthen us. For those of us facing decisions and we're not really quite sure the right way to take, we ask for your wisdom to make the right decision. For whatever it is that we need from you, Father, thank you that you're our provider. You've told us to pray for those in authority over us. We lift up our nation to you. We lift up our leaders to you. How desperately we need a return to righteousness. How desperately we need men and women uh, in places of leadership who would recognize their need of your wisdom and your direction. We pray for that, Father. And Lord, we pray for those around the world who are still serving our nation in harm's way. We lift them up to you. Pray your protection over them and their comfort to them and their families as they're separated this holiday season. But we also realize that there are men and women around the world separated from their families because they have obeyed your call to go other places and spread the gospel. And we lift them up to you as well. And for our brothers and sisters in the family of God who are living in places that just because of their faith in you, their lives are at risk. We lift them up to you and pray your honor on them. Lord, we've gathered here today and those who will be watching online in, in days and weeks to come, you knew that we were going to be exposed to today's service. You knew that we were going to be listening or watching or we would be here in the building and you have something for each of us. So I pray that we would be tuned in to what you would say to us, that we would be alert to truth that we need for our lives so that when we conclude our time together today, we can say, I'm glad I took the time to go to church because God spoke to me. We do thank you, Lord, that you're our provider. We recognize that everything we have comes from you. And we, at this point of our worship, give back to you your tithes and our offerings. We do it as an act of obedience to your word. We do it as an act of gratitude for all you've done for us. And we do it as an act of faith of what you're going to continue to do for us. So accept the gifts we bring, whether we have given through the week electronically or through the mail 
or through a bank transfer or whether we give here in the building, however and whenever we give, we're doing it in obedience and faith and gratitude. So accept our gifts through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson today covers John 13 and 14. The setting is, this is the upper room. <clears throat> Jesus had just had what we call the Last Supper with his disciples. He has talked to them about him being betrayed. Judas has basically identified himself and has left the room and gone to meet with the people who are going to uh, arrest Jesus later that evening. And then Jesus begins to teach his disciples. And as I was working on, on this lesson, I realized one of these years I need to just spend four or five months in these chapters because there's so much that Jesus teaches us because these are his last words before his crucifixion. And as he teaches them, he gets interrupted four separate times. Now, not each of the interruptions is phrased as a question, but inherent within each of the interruptions is a question for Christ. And Jesus answers them. And so we're going to look at these questions for Christ, not just as it relates to those first century disciples, but as it relates to you and me. And we begin our reading in John chapter 13, verse 33. My children, Jesus said to them, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, for I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, will all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Aren't you glad for those people that ask the questions that you want to ask, but you're kind of embarrassed to ask? So Simon Peter says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. And that's when Jesus tells him, well, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So Peter asks the question, Lord, why can't I go where you're going? In other words, what we would say is, Lord, why can't I go to heaven now? You know, why do I have to wait? And, and Peter basically says, Lord, if you're going somewhere and I can't go with you, I want to know why I can't go with you. And, and it introduces us to what we know as a statement you've heard from all kinds of different people. Timing is everything. The reason I don't make multi-millions of dollars playing basketball is not that I can't make a basket. I can make a basket. You give me enough chances, you know, I can make a basket, but I can't do it when I need to do it, right? Timing is everything. To be at the right place is not enough. You have to be at the right place at the right time. <laughs> like the guy said, my ship finally did come in. <clears throat> But unfortunately, I was at the airport waiting on my plane to come in. You know, so, you know, it, it's not enough to be at the right place. We have to be at the right place at the right time. And as I was mulling on this over the last couple of days, a word stuck out to me from verse 36 when Jesus said, you can't follow me now, but you will follow later. Now, so many times in our lives, even as Christians, we're all hung up on now. But what we need to understand is there are some things that are for later. As we walk with God, there are things God wants us to do later. And usually there are lessons that we need to learn later so that we can do the work that God has called us to do later. It's not all about just now. There are times in your life, I'm sure, when you felt that you heard God say something about what he wanted to do in you or through you, and it hasn't happened yet. That doesn't mean you haven't heard from God. It just may mean that you haven't gotten to that chapter of your life yet. And there are things, I'm sure, as you reflect back over your life, there are things that you went through and you wondered, what in the world is this for? Maybe you met somebody and you wondered, that was kind of random. What happened there? Or things happened in your life that seemed to be just out of the blue. And maybe six weeks later or six months later or six years later, something happened and you thought, that's what that was about. 
If I hadn't have met this person, I wouldn't have had this opportunity. If I hadn't had that experience, I wouldn't have been prepared for that experience. I remember uh, when I moved to the second church that I pastored, uh, there was a very strong personality in the church. And my dad, who'd pastored for years and whose wisdom I am grateful to have, said to me, you know, I'd be a little bit concerned about you taking that church because of that person that's there, except I know what you had in your last church. And he said, you learned how to handle it in that. And so that helped prepare you for what was next. And so many times in our life, professionally, personally, spiritually, what we're going through now is not just about now. It's about preparation for later. So don't get impatient with because it doesn't feel like everything's falling into place right now. It may be that God is preparing you for later. Just three examples from the Old Testament. Abraham. You remember that Abraham was promised that he and Sarah would have descendants as numerous as the sands of the sea. It was 25 years later when Isaac was born. And there were things that Abraham and Sarah had to learn in that 25 years to prepare them for dealing what God was going to call them to do with Isaac. You've got Joseph. He was 17 when God gave him the dream of what he would do in his life. He, it was 30 when he was fulfilled. 13 years he waited. And in those 13 years, he went through a bunch of stuff. You read it like from chapter 37 or so in Genesis on. He went through all kinds of trials and tests and tribulations, imprisonment. But he learned to handle the responsibility that would come later. You've got Moses. When he was 40 years old, God called him. You're going to lead my people out of Egypt. But it was 40 more years until it happened. And you remember what Moses was doing in those 40 years? He was working for his father-in-law, tending sheep in the Midian Desert. And guess what the Midian Desert was? The very same desert that Moses led the children of Israel through for their 40 years wandering. You went wonder if maybe uh, those 40 years in that wilderness were preparation for what was coming next. So please understand that timing is everything. And sometimes we can't go to heaven now because God's not ready for us yet. He's not done with us down here. Think about Peter. He's the one who asked the question. God had work for Peter to do. Peter had to learn about restoration after his denial so that he could teach forgiveness. He had to experience the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost so he would learn the secret of the Christian life. He had to open the door to the Gentiles. It was Peter who opened the door of the gospel to the Gentiles. It was Peter who wrote First and Second Peter, uh, uh, gospels to Christians who were going through intense times of tribulation and persecution. Yes, he would follow Christ eventually. Jesus said, you'll come later, but I have work for you to do now. And the same thing is true for us. Why, why can't we go to heaven now? The old timers used to talk about being homesick for heaven. Well, it's because God's not finished with us yet. I had a very touching experience a while back with one of my residents at one of the facilities where I serve as chaplain. She had lived her entire life for the Lord, and she had experienced that downward spiral from independence to assisted living, and now she's in a skilled nursing home, she has to wait for people to bring her her food. She has to wait for people to bathe her. And it is just, as you can understand, slowly sapping her joy and her strength and even her peace. And she grabbed hold of my hand one day and she said, why won't God just let me go home? I'm ready. She's talking about heaven. Why is he leaving me here? And she paused a moment and then she said, I guess he's not through with me down here yet. Yes, that's the answer. He's not through with us here. There are still lessons we need to learn. There are still work that we need to do. God still has a job for you to do. That's why you're still here. You can't go to heaven now because God's not finished with you down here yet. There's still work to do. Second interruption is John 14, 
And this is Thomas. Jesus is giving that beautiful speech of, you know, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God in my Father's house or many mansions. And he says, you know, verse 4, the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas, again, thank you, Thomas, for answering, asking the question we all are asking. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you'd know my Father as well, and from now on you do know him and have seen him. So Thomas says, Lord, how do we get to you? How, how can we get to God? That's really one of the primary questions of life. Somebody put it this way. Every person has a fundamental need for a satisfying philosophy of life, a hierarchy of personal values, and a faith that gives meaning to life. How do you get that? You get that through knowing God through Jesus Christ. In so many religions, God is put up on top of a mountain as some kind of a goal to be achieved or an end to be realized that if you just work hard enough or you're strong enough or you're good enough, somehow you can get to God. That's not the lesson of Christianity. The lesson of Christianity is that God has come down to us and he says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Obviously, we're going to be talking about that as we get deeper into the month of December and get closer to Christmas, that God has revealed himself through Jesus and we get to God through Jesus. St. Augustine said, I don't say to you, seek a way. The way himself has come to you. How do you get to God? Jesus is the way. How do you know the truth? Jesus is the truth. What's the source of life? It's Jesus. And, and Thomas said, Lord, I, we don't know where you're going. How can we get to you? How can we relate to you? And, and Jesus says, it's through me. The way you get to God is through Jesus. Well, Philip piggybacks on that in verse 8 and said, Lord, well, if you show us the Father, that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been with you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it's the Father living in me who's doing his work. <laughs> Philip says, Lord, what's God like? You tell us that we get to him through Jesus, but, but what's he like? Now, this is Philip. You may remember his first introduction to Christ in John chapter 1. He was well-versed in the scripture. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. He had followed Christ from Jesus' earliest days of ministry. He knew all the God words, but he's still saying, God, what do you like? And let's be honest and admit that probably for a long time in some of our lives, we knew all the God words, but we really didn't know what he was like. We knew the lingo, we knew the things to say, but we really didn't know what he was like. And this subject, what is God like, is perhaps the basic question in life and is perhaps the basic question of Christianity. What is God like? The answer to that subject, the answer to that question, will determine how you live. Your idea of what God is like will determine how you relate to him. As kind of a general rule, I find it easier to help people that had no church background at all find their way to God than people who've been in church all their lives. Because, you know, sometimes church has a way of really messing you up, and you get all kinds of warped ideas about who God is. And, and you know, if you don't believe that God is good, you'll have trouble receiving good gifts from him. You'll even have trouble praying for blessings if you don't believe God is good. If you don't believe God is holy, you'll live carelessly. You know, the, the way you view God, how you see God, will determine how you live your life. And so we go through life on this search. <clears throat> there is within man and you know, mankind this sense that something's missing until we connect 
with God. I mean, that's how he created us. And so when we think about what God is like, most of us lean on our experiences. Um, I don't, they still do collage. I don't know if people still do collage or not. I never did collage. But collage is when you take all kinds of different pictures and you put them on a piece of wood and you do something on them. So they, there's this, uh, of course, now you do it digitally. And I don't remember what it's called. It's called pick something or other. But, you know, you see them on Facebook and stuff where people put like eight or ten different pictures from different times all in one frame. That's what we used to, us old timers, called a collage. Most of us, when we think about who God is and what he's like, have a collage. There's a bunch of snapshots from our life that color our picture of who we think God is. Maybe we had an absent father, or maybe we had a very overbearing father, and so when you think of God as father, we've got a warped view. Maybe we had a loved one who was sick, and we prayed, and the loved one got better, and there's a snapshot, God answers prayer. And then we had a friend who had a baby who got sick, and we prayed, but the baby died, and so we have a snapshot, God doesn't answer prayer. Or we pray for some catastrophe to be averted, and it's not averted, so, well, God must not be a good God. And, and through our years, we have all of these snapshots that come together to tell, to color our view of who God is. And as a result of that, a lot of us are messed up, you know, in our view of God. I told you about one lady we were talking with. You know, we as Christians talk about giving your life to Christ. And she says, you, you don't understand. You're telling me to, to commit my life to live for this man that I've never seen when every man I've had any kind of relationship with, my father, my ex, you know, they've all been bad. And now you're telling me I'm supposed to trust some man I've never seen. She says, you don't understand how difficult that is. And so we have this collage of snapshots of this must be what God is like. <coughs> and sometimes I hear people describe what they think God is like. And I think, no wonder they don't go to church. No wonder they're not interested in God. Because they don't know who he really is. And the solution is given in these verses by Jesus. Thomas, if you've seen me, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What is God like? God's like Jesus. And oh, how we need to understand that. God is like Jesus. Back in the 1990s, <laughs> that's a long time ago, Back in the 1990s, Joan Osborne had a song that I think surprised everybody, and I don't know if it reached number one or not, but it was got a lot of airplay. It was called One of Us. And, and it was about, the course was, what if God was one of us? And, you know, if God had a name, what would it be? If God had a face, what would he look like? And I actually used that song as the, the kickoff to a series of sermons that December called I have a face, I have a name, I am one of you. Because that's what Christmas is all about. God is one of us. He came through Jesus. And if you want to know what God is like, study the life of Jesus. Now, you know, in a month it's going to be January. And a lot of people around the world in January decide, I'm going to read the Bible through this year. And you do great through Genesis. You start to slow down a little bit in Exodus by the time you get to Leviticus, here's how you know if the spot in your wall is leprosy or not. You, uh, uh, no, 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 no. You know? and, and so many people have read Genesis about 30 times and have never gotten to Deuteronomy. You know? um, so I, I want to suggest something else to you. And you don't have to wait until January. I suggest read the Gospels. Start with Matthew. You know, and read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And yes, there's a lot of repetition. So wait a minute, I read this before. Yeah, it's okay. But if you read the Gospels and saturate yourself with the Gospels, you'll learn who Jesus is. 
And as you learn who Jesus is, you learn who God is. You know, we've spent, I don't know, most of this year studying the parables and the miracles and the teachings of Jesus. You know, Charles Spurgeon said that the year that transformed his ministry was the year that he decided he would read and study only the Gospels the entire year. And he said so many people came to him through that year and told him what an impact his sermons had made on them and how different his preaching was. And he said, it was because I had saturated myself with the Gospels. So let me encourage you to do that. Maybe two or three times next year. Read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Take different translations, different ways of doing it. You know, there's a chronological Bible that'll put them in order. You know, there's all kinds of different ways to do that. But as you learn about Jesus, you learn who the Father is. What's God like? He's like Jesus. And that leads us to the fourth interruption, which is down in chapter 14, starting in verse 21. Jesus says, whoever has my commandments and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, there were two of them, this is not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Now he asks the question, why? But when you read Jesus' answer, you understand that Jesus answered the how question. How are you going to reveal yourself? Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. Judas's question is, how do you intend to reveal yourself to us? How can we know who you are. And again, I say, even though the, the translation uses the word why, Jesus' answer is a how answer. This is how I'm going to reveal ourselves to you. And he says two things that in Jesus' vocabulary are synonyms. <laughs> he says, love me and obey me. And he said, if you love me, you will obey me. I mean, it's really pretty simple, you know. Jesus just says, you got to love me and you've got to obey me, and then we'll reveal ourselves to you, and you will know who we are. The more obedience there is in your life, the more understanding you'll have of God. The more disobedience there is in your life, the more confusion there will be in your life as it relates to God. That's just the way it works. Obedience is the key. You know, James says obedience is how you show you have faith. Faith without works, obedience is dead. Jesus says obedience is how you show me that you love me. It's really basic. It's really simple. Not easy, but basic and simple. How does God reveal himself to us? When we love him and obey him. And then he says, if you really do that, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And he will teach you my words, and he will remind you of these things. So as we live our lives in obedience, and you know it's true. I mean, you just sit there and say, we know this preacher. Why are you spending time preaching it? We know this. The more we live in obedience, the closer we get to God, and the more we understand him. Because there are lessons that we learn as we obey, especially obedience and the tough stuff, you know, that we learn about God that we didn't know otherwise. And as long as there's disobedience in our life, that disobedience blocks God revealing himself to us. I, I read a, a, a blog post or something by a man named Don, Dan Johnson, and he talked about studying with a well-known biblical scholar in Cambridge, England. And Dan said, one day I asked him, from all of your years of scholarship, what is the rock bottom essence of the Christian life? And he said, the man said, I think I found it. It sounds way too simple, but I'm convinced of its merit. It's found in an old song whose chorus goes like this, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. 
but to trust and obey. Somebody said one step forward in obedience is worth years of study about obedience. How does God reveal himself to us? In response to our love and obedience. But I don't want to leave without looking at that word in verse 23. We will make our home with you. That's an incredible statement. Now, we just came out of one holiday that often is home-based. We're heading into another holiday that's often home-based. Oh, I have had some interesting discussions on my job sites about home and family. <laughs> and I will tell you this. If you have a happy home and family, you are blessed. And I'm about ready to decide that you might be in a minority. You know? But so, you know, if, if, you, if the thought of, being with your relatives over the holidays fills you with dread. Um, that's not what Jesus is talking about. Um, he, he, that, just stop and think about it. Jesus said, if you love me and obey me, my Father and I will love you and make our home with you. Now, maybe some of you all got to do some housekeeping before you let Jesus in. But he said, I, we'll make our home. Now, the word home used by the first century Jews meant what usually we mean when we talk about home. It's not a house. It's not a place of lodging. It's what happens inside there. It's, it's home. It's fellowship. It's intimacy. It's joy. It's peace. It's safety. And again, I'm well aware that not everybody has that home. But if you don't have it, you probably long for it. And what I want to say to you today is you can have that with God. That's an amazing thing, that you can have home in your faith. God is everywhere, yes, but he's not everywhere in the same way. And there is something about him being with us in home. I've got a couple of favorite places. One we were just at. It's at Cherry Grove Beach, sitting on the porch, looking at and listening to and smelling the ocean. Love it. The other is my den. When I think about home, that's what I think of. Sitting in my recliner with a remote in my hand. <laughs> but, but being home, there's something about, you know, it's nice to have the kids home. I love it when they're all home, and I have to leave the den when they're all home because they take it over. But but to hear their laughter and their joy as they tell old stories and as they share memories and as they talk about experiences, and there's laughter and there's joy. Nobody's tense. Nobody's afraid. Nobody's scared they might say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. There ain't nothing there that they can break that we'll get upset about. You know, they're home. There's something beautiful about home. And Jesus says, that's the kind of relationship I want to have with you. You know, I, I'm, I'm not being sacrilegious here. It's like Jesus is saying, I want to hang out with you. I, I want to hang out in the den with you, you know. I want to watch football with you. I, I want you to feel peace around me. I want you to feel joy around me. I want you to feel security and safety around me. I don't want you to be scared of me. I don't want you to dread me coming in. I want to be home with you. That's an incredible truth. And it's the word Jesus used. If you love me, if you obey me, I'm going to come home with you. And it'll be home. That That's a beautiful, poorly described picture of what God wants to be with us. Home. Peace, joy, serenity, security, safety with Jesus. Four incredibly important questions. Why can't I go to heaven now? Because God's still got work for you to do. How do I get to God? You get to him through Jesus. 
What's he like? He's like Jesus. How can I learn more about him? How does he reveal himself to me? As I love him and obey him. Is Christ at home with you? Love and obedience unlocks the door. Father, I, I hope that somehow you can take that description and somehow make it live in each of our lives. What it means to have God be at home with us. Because it doesn't say you'll make your home with me. We know that's coming when we get to heaven. But you say you'll make your home with us. And that's a staggering thought. It's a thought way beyond the ability of me to put it into words. But Lord, help us to understand that that's who you are and that's who you want to be with us. You want to be at home with us. So Father, as we get deeper toward Christmas, may we remember these questions and the answers to them, that you still have work for us to do, that we get to you through Jesus, that you are like Jesus, and as we love you and obey you, you show us more of yourself. So I pray that this month would be a month of us drawing closer to you and would be a month of us really experiencing in the midst of all of the chaos that happens this month. May our lives be centered and focused and at peace because you have made your home with us. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming out today. You're